Good morning. Glad to see that you're not all out shoving already. I don't know when the shops are opening for today. Um, but today we will kind of look at what could be done for stuff like this. Pretty much what you're looking in to uh, as an assignment. This is just some older data um, where my phone that was logging this was kind of <coughs> giving me kind of twice the distance as what I was actually covering at the time um, because of some failure in my phone. I just had to tighten some screws and it was fine again. Um, it's the first time ever um, that that worked. But it's one of those cases where you, with a human eye, you can see that there is a path there. So I probably followed that. You cannot see there's a path there, but if you look at the satellite image, you'll see that as well. So it's one of those cases where if you know what happened, it's very good, easy to give a good estimate. The challenge is sometimes, well, when to trust your model, when not to, um, and what to do when things are just off. <coughs> Another thing that you may or may not have noticed, if you position some GPS coordinates on a map and you know exactly where that coordinate is in real life, some maps are shifted a little bit. How many have noticed that? If you look at points and you're actually not where you think you are, even though if you leave your device for a long time and say that accuracy is within, say, a few meters, you may be told that you are on the other side of something that you're definitely not on. Have you tried that? A few? Um, so that there are some weird things happening that are not, you can say, the kind of white noise that we like, but has some kind of color to it. I think the best story I got was uh, someone who's chasing uh, uh, Pokemons, and you want to train them. So he figured out that if he moved his phone from one place to another place, it would find satellites on different sides of the building. And then it was actually moving quite fast. <laughs> so you can just <laughs> wait for a new catch and a new catch. And he was doing quite good. Well, today, there is a bit of recap and a bit of extension. Um, so we are going to look at our models on a state-based form. We kind of did that already. We will look at a random walk with some measurement noise. We will look at the common filter when observation starts missing, which is one of the big differences. We will look into maximum likelihood estimation using the common filter or state space models in general. And then we will just briefly touch upon time varying systems. And then there'll be a, a brief example at the end. And I will also go back to the falling body, body example from last week to show you some features or how I should phrase it. Um, so this is basically a slide from last week. We have our linear stochastic state space model where we have system equation and we have an observation equation. If we were why in this course, we would probably consider making the system in continuous time, and there are tools to do that. We discussed last week how to go from continuous to discrete time. So I won't deal with that, but just say we are in a discrete time setting. As for the parameters, we assume that they are known matrices. I got a question this morning, so I'll just underline that. Um, the variance of the system, or the system noise, we call that sigma 1 here. And the observation noise, we call that sigma 2, the covariance matrix for that. And it's important to recognize that it's a markup process. So all the information you need about the future is contained in the current state of the model. That's the important thing. And I'll show this slide again later. So the AMA model as a state space model, we actually did this. I don't know if you remember. We did it in a slightly different setting. Mm -hmm. 
We have at least something very, very similar to this. Yes? Yes, indeed. Rewriting it as a multivariate AR1 model. So basically, what you look at here is an AR1 model with some noise with some correlation structure. So that's just a covariance matrix for the noise matrix. So it's basically just an AR1 model. And back then, what we said was, well, we just treat the first state in xt here. The first element there, we treat that as our response. The difference we do now is that uh, it's quite easy to multiply with a row vector, with a one, and then a number of zeros. So now we can write it in this form. So that is any armor model written on state space model. The duration to get to these coefficients, or aim to show that these coefficients it works, is the exact same thing. If you just start with, say, an AR2 model, well, you need these two coefficients here, and you can kind of identify what the individual s elements in X represent. So that's fairly easy. It just takes some time to go through that. Um, the one thing to notice is that you can say there will be s some of these phi's or thetas that may be zero, depending on the order. What is important is that to pick the order of the system, as in the order of the length of xt, as the maximum of the order of the ar part and the ma part plus one. The plus one is because we need a one up there to get the most recent ST, uh, epsilon directly through the system. There's one thing here that is a little bit different from, what, from the stage space we model we used last week. I don't know if you can see two major differences from what we did last week. Or even just go back to this slide. There are two things that are a little bit different when comparing the definition of here and here. Yes? Yes, so we don't have any input, and that's actually quite normal, you can say. So that's not a big thing, but the other thing you mentioned is that there is multiplied a G matrix here on the epsilon, like this. That, that's one of the things that is different. There's one more thing that is different. Yes? Exactly. There's no observation noise here. So y is just equal to c t and times x. I think that is the biggest, you can say, difference in my view. This here has another element to it. It means that the noise that you have here is univariate. Whereas in a general formulation, you have it, the noise up here has the same dimension as the system with some covariance matrix. Basically here, we just say that we only use one of the, say, the d-dimensional noise elements that we would have, and we all I mean, weight them. So it's a quite different noise system that you have as opposed to the just a standard um, state space model, because we only use the you can say a univariate noise as opposed to multivariate noise. Of course, we know that we are going to replicate a univariate model, so we should only use univariate noise. It should not be a surprise, but it's just one more thing to keep track of. And you can say, if you have a multivariate armor model, basically, and I think we also discussed that previously, you just have to plug in matrices everywhere as coefficients, and everywhere you have a one, you plug in the identity matrix of the corresponding order of the multivariate model. So it's fairly easy to rewrite, you can say, any model on this form. Now, why would you want to do that? 
That should be more clear in a moment. First, let's just look at a simple model. We have a random walk model, so we have xt is equal to the previous x plus some noise, and then yt is equal to xt plus another noise signal. And the two noise signals, we consider those to be normally distributed and independent. So we say this is a random walk that is not directly observed. The observations are influenced by some measurement noise. Now, can we actually describe this model in the framework of an ARIMA model? Can we write this model, the state space model, can we go backwards from this model to a univariate ARIMA model? And I, of course the answer is yes we can, otherwise I would not ask it. So, how would you proceed for that? There's a trick to this. The trick is that we know that we are in a random walk signal. We want to kind of look at the difference series to make something stationary. If we do that on yt, what do we get out? Well, we can write it, just take the Nabla operator, the difference operator, and apply it to each of the elements on the right-hand side. So that gives us Nabla xt plus Nabla epsilon t. That was the easy part. Now, we have to kind of figure out what are these two different terms. Nabla xt, what is that equal to? Exactly, so if you look at it, it's xt minus xt minus 1. That's Nabla xt. So that equals just either t. And this out here, well, that is epsilon t minus epsilon t minus 1. So if you just look at this, what do we get? From this, what would you guess which model structure? You did a similar thing in the one of the exercises last week. Well, you have a nabla on the y, and then you have a sum of some noises. How many lakhs of noise are represented? Well, that's obviously lag t and a t minus 1. So whenever you have a lag t minus 1 in the noise, what, can, what does that tell you? Which kind of model are we looking at? You need a, 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 a moving order. You need a moving average or, of order one, exactly. We did a different thing up here. So we need a one there. And if you look at the autocollation function, you can show that this here is actually fully described by a moving average model of order one. So there's no AR part. So the model that you get this is just the duration. If you look at the autocollation function and you calculate that for this model, you can show that, well, it's per, per default always 1 when k is 0. And then for k equals 1, it's different from 0. And when k is greater than 1, it is 0. So it is the ACF of a moving average 1 model that we're looking at there when we look at the difference yt. 
So we basically just get a moving average model where the coefficient is the ratio between or some function of the noises of the observation noise, it scales with the and then divided by something that scales also with the system noise. So you could adequately describe the model by this system down here instead. Nabla yt equals to eta t plus theta of 1 eta, uh, no, not eta, whatever, uh, epsilon t minus 1. So we could describe it as a univariate model. So now, in some cases, you can take a state phase model and describe it as a one dimensional Riemann model. We showed that before, that we could take any Armour model and describe it as a state space model. So, in some cases, you can go both ways, but not always. So, if you want to kind of figure out what are the different uh, parameters, so if you want to figure out what is the sigma you have down here and what is the theta 1 that you have here in this model definition, well, basically, what you have to do is to equate the autocovariance uh, from the one model to the other model. And likewise, for the parameter here, basically, you look at the autocorrelation at like 0 and like 1, or the autocovariance at like 0 and like 1. And then you can solve these equations. Shouldn't be too hard for some, someone like you. You have two equations, two unknowns, that you can do. Um, so I won't spend time on actually going through that. But just to say and repeat that the armor coefficients, um, they are actually, the, the noise parts are covariance parts in the uh, state space formulation. OK, back to the definition. Just to recap this one here, again, we have known matrices still here. We looked at the Kalman filter last week. Now, what happens if you do not observe something at some point in time? What we discussed was that when we got a new measurement, we can do the reconstruction. That's basically these. Calculate the common gain. Update the expectation of xt given t using the prediction that you made plus the common gain times the difference between the observation and the prediction. And then you update the covariance matrix of xt correspondingly. When you've done that, you can predict so the next time step, basically just doing conditional expectation on the system equation to get this part. And then, well, the only thing up here that has uncertainty is the x. So we pre and post multiply it by a, and a transpose. And then you add the system noise. And finally, when you're predicting the covariance matrix for the observation, well, that comes true. This equation here. So you have C and XT. So therefore, you get C sigma XX T plus 1 given T C, C transpose plus the observation noise. But what happens if you miss an observation at some point? Yes? You here? But you do not observe your current position. You make an observation with noise of your current position. You use your, you make an observation yt of your, but you may not observe all states. And then 
But this is also my predicted observation. This is x hat t given t minus 1. That's the prediction from the previous iteration. This is my predicted observation. Here I have to multiply by c, but if you observe all states, well, then you're comparing the observation with directly with x t given t minus 1. So you're comparing y t with the one step prediction. So I think you're saying the same thing as it is here, but there's something that you haven't read. Or there's, there's some time index. I think the biggest challenge when implementing a Kalman filter is basically to get the time indices correct everywhere. I see some of you nodding. That means you've tried. <laughs> um, so you have to keep track of what is, you can say, a reconstructed state and what is a predictor state. And have to keep track of where they are in time relative to one another. When you store them in matrices and arrays or whatever you do, you have to keep track that you have everything at the right time so that you can compare things. That, that is actually the biggest challenge uh, in doing this. So it is, you can say, this loop is running for time t. So what I do is that I take the prediction I made at the previous point in time and I make a reconstruction. So I use the observation time t to get an, a reconstructed estimation of where I'm at and the corresponding uncertainty for, this, for the system. Having done this, save these, then I make a new prediction for the next observation and the corresponding variance and covariance of the observation. Then I step time and repeat. That, that's, uh, but if you have a more particular question, we can discuss that, uh, take, take that later. Uh, but the question here remains, what happens if you, you do not observe why? Yes. Indeed, you cannot. You can do the prediction, but you cannot do the re reconstruction. But in order to do the next prediction, you need to do some kind of reconstruction. But what happens? Well, if you don't observe anything, then this element here doesn't provide any information, right? So basically, what you do is that you say you reconstructed x t given t. Well, you did not get any inf new information, so you just used your predicted value from here and disregard the last part. Now, what do you do for the variance? Well, you didn't get any new information, so you just used the old one. One way, and this is another way to implement it, but it's one way to get to that result, is to say that you make a random observation of y, but it has infinite variance. That means that you consider this one here is infinite, which means the Kalman gain will be zero. If the Kalman gain is zero, this term here is zero, and that is zero. Everything works smooth. So that's one way to, tr to kind of Implemented is not the best way, since you know what the solution is, you just disregard those last part out there, and you do a reconstruction step where you don't update anything. Because you've got new inf no new information, you cannot do anything. Okay. Now, another thing, when we looked at ARMA models, we assumed that there were no gaps in data. I don't know if you have thought of that, um, but now we know that the Kalman filter can handle missing data. We also know that we can take any ARMA model and write it as a Kalman filter. So what to do? So we could actually, using the Kalman filter, we can make predictions 
even though that we don't have any observations. So this is one way where we can do estimation based on what we have observed, even though that we do not have complete, uh, complete observations. So far, I think we live in the naive world where we observe everything all the time, but that is not reality. I will just recap the example from last week, um, where I make a falling body. First, I just initialize. I won't go through this, I'll just run it. The black line underneath in here that is the state, and the red point are the obser observations. And if we plot the velocity, well, it's just accelerating, going faster and faster down. I have my common filter, as I also mentioned last week. I will not share that. What I will share is the definition of the input for that. It has this function definition. And just as some hints, basically you want to have, if you want, you don't have to implement it as a function when you do your assignment. But I got some questions from some of you how to deal with this. Um, so that's why I'm just using a little bit of time here. You have some input data that you want to kind of share. If you only have one dimensional data, it's a vector, otherwise it's a matrix. That's probably obvious. You want to give all the coefficients matrices as arguments, as constants. Then you may or may not have an input. If you don't, you can just skip that whole part about the input. You can also thereby skip the B matrix. Then you need to set an initial position. Where do I, if you go back here, you need to figure out how to, to specify mu0 and v0 somehow. Down here. And then I have some other options that are, are just there. You should not care about those. Um, and then you should also consider at the end of the filter, do I want to get an end step prediction? Which is, again, just the same thing as considering I got no new observation, so I just keep predicting without doing any reconstruction. So what I did last week, just as a quick recap, my object here that it returns is a list with seven elements. The first one is the reconstructed state, then the predictions. Notice that the prediction has NA in the first element because there's no prediction corresponding to the first point because you need that to make a prediction. Then the common gain, because we know that this, we assume, as we discussed last week, that the variance was zero of where you started. So we start with zeros here. And then we have the reconstructed sigma xx, likewise sigma yy. And then the one step predictions. And again, we have some NAs down here corresponding to the first covariance matrix not being predicted. It was given as an input. You could copy it in there, but I decided not to have it in there. We looked at it last week. These were the data. And the estimates, I mean, the, the green band around that is where you predict things are to be. Everything looks nice. The next thing we did was to start at the wrong position. So the only thing I've changed is that rather than starting 10,000 meter, 10, meters above ground with no velocity, I start 6,000 meters above. And if I just plot that on top, I don't know if you recall this from last week. Now, was that a good idea, what we just did there? 
I did it to exemplify that no matter how bad a place you start, you will, after some time, you will get close to where you want to be. But in this case, it didn't work quite well because my initial covariance matrix was said to be zero of where I was. So I said I know exactly that I'm at this particular altitude. If I instead still use the wrong ah, starting point, but I say that the diagonal matrix of my variance for the, so the uncertainty of my position is increased. Now it's specified as 10 times the variance of the, of the measurement. I'll just rerun this. I don't know if you can see them again, the line. But very, very quickly, it converges to the green line when we started at very close to optimal values. So within, say, five observations, so we're very, very close. Even in the first step, the first update, well, since we got an observation up there, we are pulled almost to the right position. So the important thing is that whenever you start somewhere, you have to associate it with an uncertainty that matches. So if you know exactly where you are, it's okay to have a small variance. If you have uncertainty as where you start, you need to have a correspondingly larger variance of that. So it doesn't matter, in this case, it doesn't matter where you start, as long as the variance is big enough, then you will get up to the right, you can see, the, the optimal trace very soon. And when you get further down here, well, you cannot really distinguish. Now, the next thing I kind of wanted to get at is, what is things are missing? on the way. I will make a copy of my observations and then I will take, I should take what the length of y. I have 47 observations. I will take 32 of those and make them NA. So now rather than having a full matrix where there's something everywhere, I have a lot of things that did not observe. If I run my filter through that, Again, I will go back and start by saying, I know that I did start at the 10,000 meters above. So this is my data now. The black line is what we did not observe. The red circles is what we now observed. And those are my reconstructed states all the way through. Can you figure out why it actually performs this well? I mean, if you look at this, if you go back, it's a little bit off in here, but it's very, very close. And all the observations that we predicted were are, are nicely within. Can you figure out why it behaves so nice? Yes? The covariance, yeah, if you observe, uh, you're on the right track. Uh, if you observe everything every time, then your covariance matrix will stabilize after a few observations. Now, in this case, where you do not observe things for a period of time, it does actually increase all the time in between. But since the covariance matrix for the system, as in the noise for the system, here, um, when doing the prediction, sigma 1, 1 is much smaller than sigma 2, 2. As in much, factor of, well, one is of the order of 2 and the other one is of the order of 10,000. Um, that's actually the reason, but it's connected to what you said. 
Now, just to see that that is actually what is happening, I will try to just take the sigma from before and make it at first just 100 times larger. Now you can see that whenever there's a gap between observation, the interval here, as in the variance, increases. And when I get an observation, poof, it narrows quickly again. So, so that, and if I increase it even further, the variance, let me just, now it's the same order, let me just make it 5,000, then it's the same variance as the observation. Now we are almost looking at a Christmas tree, you know, on a very wind windy day. Uh, basically, that, that, that is the impression you should have, that the variance is increasing and then you get observations and it's decreased again. And then you ha it's increasing and you get observations and it's decreased again. That's the intuition that I want you to have. So uh, looking at kind of some kind of a Christmas tree is a good, it's a little bit irregular, you could say in this case, because I, I remove some random observations, but the intuition is that it should just grow out in a, in a second order manner and then come back in whenever you have observations. Now you can say, how, how much can we stress this system? What if we had 49? What if we are left with only nine observations? around. You can say the good part up here, everything is still smooth, even though we do not have that many observations. Here you can see that, well, increasing the variance to a very large number, we can go back to the initial, not too large. We st it still works. It's not beautiful. I mean, perfectly not, but it still works. Um, now the question is, which one is better? Now I have to rerun the whole thing here because otherwise I will get into a problem. Um, no, this is fine. Um, now I'll go back to the case where I observed everything. I didn't have to do that, but I'll just do that. But first, I will go back here. <coughs> so, this was also a recap. The maximum likelihood estimates in state space models. We have this structure here, where now I include like a G matrix up here. You can say, you can either have it as a matrix that you are up multiply on the noise, or you can kind of build that into the covariance structure of the noise. Those two are equivalent. The important thing is that the two noise here are mutually uncorrelated and they are normally distributed with some covariances. And we have G times sigma one. Well, you can just take G times sigma one, G transpose on sigma one, and then you could remove the G up there. But this is just a structure that is easiest to construct when you have an armor model. And notice also for the armor model, sigma 2 is equal to 0. So likelihood. This is a slide that I've shown you something very similar to a long time ago. So basically, we let this curly y represent all the previous, all the observations that are available, and then we take sigma theta here, and that contains all the parameters in the model. Not just the moving average part, but all parameters in the model. And then we define the likelihood as the joint density of observing all the available observations given the parameters. And then we just need to find the parameters so that the density function is maximized. That's basically the task. 
That we've discussed before. And we also discussed one more thing before. We're looking at the conditional expectation of yn given information up to yn minus 1. Now, remember that the state space model is a Markov process. That means that all the observation about the one step prediction is in the current state. So we can take this joint density and factorize it out because this density here is only, you can say, the distribution of the error of the end observation. And the prediction is, and the distribution is based solely on the previous. You don't need all the previous ones, you just need the previous one. So you can continue doing this all the way down to the first one. And then we can use the common filter to give us all these conditional distributions, assuming a normal distribution. So basically, we just have to run through the common filter. We start with xt given t as the expected value of xt given all information up till this time, and the corresponding covariance, well, that's the definition that we've used so far. So we can predict one time step ahead. In this case, we don't have any input, so we'll omit the b times u here. And then we have the predicted covariance. We can then say what is the expected observation and the covariance basis of the observation. Now, what we have to care about when we're doing maximum likelihood, if we go back one slide, we have to care about the observations, not the states. So we want to look at these two predictions. That is given the distribution of y t plus 1, given all the previous observations, and given the parameters that we used. So that's basically it. And if we assume this is a normal distribution, well, then you just have to look at the density of that observation at that point in time with this mean value and that covariance. So that's basically what you have to do. And then this is basically recapping what I said a little bit earlier, that at time t plus 1, you have two options for the reconstruction. Either the new observation is available or it is not. This is the common field of reconstruction, and this is what we said earlier on. If, the, if there's no observation, we'll just take the common gain and, and equate that to zero. And then we get down to this down here. Now, there is a tricky special case where you have two observations usually, and then all of a sudden you only observe one of them. So what do you do then? When everything is missing, you just set the common gain to zero. But if something, if you get something out, what do you do then? Basically, what you can do is to say that, well, CT there, uh, I don't have that slide just here, uh, CT is giving the how do I get from x t to y t? I just multiply by c t, c at the time. So if I, at some point in time, don't get all the state observed, I can just change the dimension of c t. And then I have to only use the corresponding, I mean, the, the correct dimensions of sigma y y as well. So it's a little bit tedious to implement that. But you can make an implementation where you just update. You can estimate the common gain, but it won't have information from all the observations, either by reducing the dimensions of out here or to just for that particular one to increase the corresponding variance of the one state that you did not observe to something huge. Both things will work in practice, and huge is just big enough to make sure that 
the corresponding information is zero that comes out of this. Um, so those are two ways of doing, you can say, a partially observed reconstruction. The likelihood function is the same as always. We look at the prediction error when we look at the associated variance. And then we have the likelihood as the product of the densities. And it's just the usual multivariate normal distribution is written in here. In practice, you will not do this. We discussed this as well. When you take the product of a lot of numbers that are less than 1 and greater than 0, you will run into numerical problems at some point, if you have enough observations. So in practice, you take the logarithm everywhere and look at the log likelihood, and then it becomes a sum. And usually, this constant that comes from the 2 pi out there, you just ignore that. Because you're doing maximum likelihood, if you're comparing models, you will have the same term here everywhere, so having a constant it doesn't matter at the end of the day. And when you make these estimates down here, well, then you can look at the Hessian of the log likelihood and use that at, as an approximation to the variance. So let's just do that. Oh, let me take this one as well. Um, because we're going to do that as well in the optimization in a moment. Initialization. I said that just a moment ago, that you have to pick an initial position, an initial state vector, and a corresponding covariance of that. One way is to just say, well, pick it to be zero, and pick a large enough covariance so that it will converge quickly, as we saw in the example before, that if you just increase the covariance of on the uncertainty of the initial state, it will converge to something nice. You can also do, as was done initially, you say, well, I will just use a good value for this with no uncertainty, and then I can run through with that. But, I mean, it's not good to be in either end here. It's good to make a compromise. So it's good to say that, at least in most cases, that's the preferred thing. You want to start somewhere. You want to make a good estimate of where you start. And you want to have the uncertainty here reflect how good you know that estimate is. If you know that you actually started in 10,000 meters above ground, exactly. and there was no uncertainty in that. This is appropriate. Most often, you won't have the luxury to know how good your initial estimate is. So usually, you need you. It's recommended to pick some a good value, and then to go from there and uh, figure out what is a good uncertainty from there. So to go back to the script, the likelihood, I think I already shared this code, so you, you have it. Um, basically, you take the observations minus the predictions. And here, you just have to keep track of indices again. Um, yours may probably be different from mine. You square the prediction errors, and you normalize each of them with the prediction covariance. So this gives us standardized squared residuals. And then I have to calculate, oops, wrong way, minus half times this sum here. So minus half times the sum on what was there, which was basically a sum of the squared residuals plus the determinant, the log determinant, oops, the log determinant of, of the observation variance. Now, this is a univariate observation, so it's, I don't have to consider the determinant. So I get a likelihood 
for the first run through, we want to postulate a good observation, a good initial guess to be minus 235. Now, for the second one, where I had the wrong initial state, and I assumed that I knew exactly where I was, if you do the same thing, I get minus 10,000. 900 some. But I want to maximize the likelihood. So there's no doubt that the first one here was much better than the second one. Now, the third case, where I still kept the initial state to be wrong at 6,000 meters, but I increased the covariance matrix of that, so I increased the uncertainty. I get, it's not as good as the first one, but I got fairly close in likelihood. Now, what would you do if you were to figure out what is a good value? One thing to do is to kind of make an objective function and use a nonlinear optimizer to, to find it. So I'll make an, my objective function here, like I use the, run the common filter, where I say, well, I know the, that there's, there's no initial velocity, and then I, I'm used the exp exponential of the second parameter as my variance parameter, and the exponential of the first parameter as my position. I'll get back to why I use the exponential. And then I calculate the likelihood in the same way as before, except that this function will minimize, so I remove the minus in front here. Because I want to find maximum likelihood. And then I just give use the optimum function, and I take the logarithm of the... Now I use 9,000 meters, I know 10,000 is a good value, and a variance of 1,000. It will converge. It gave me a value up here of the likelihood, which is fairly close, but better than the initial one I had up here. So this is minus 235. Now, this is minus 234. When you remember that one is, max, one is minus the other. So it is better than the guess I've used initially, but not a lot. And if I look at the expected value, what is what uh, sorry, exponential of that to get back in the original state? Well, the 10,000 meters was actually quite close because 10,036 meters and then a very small covariance. That is the best you can do based on this. For illustration, I will do the exact same thing. The only difference is that I have the parameter directly out here without the exponential. And I'll do the optimization, which fail. It fails simply because by per default, the optimization algorithm here, when looking for a variance, at some point it will pick a negative variance. And at some point in the algorithm, well, I cannot take the log of a negative value. So it fails. There are two ways to get around that. One is to just do a bounded optimization to set the lower equal to zero. It will work. It gives me pretty much the same height as before. It gives me zero dot zero zero variance. So so it, it hits exactly on the lower bound. Before I got something that was small, go back up here. So the initial estimate of where I started, well, it's still 10,036 meters in both cases. And the variances are close, but they're not equal. In relative terms, you cannot compare those two because zero is different from scale from anything else.
If we also estimate the gravity, we could just do that as well, because the gravity is just a parameter that was given as the input here previously. I will just guess a 9, and it comes out with, for this particular experiment, the optimal gravity is 9.5, which is not the true gravity, but it's, you can actually estimate the gravity from doing the experiment. I don't know if you know that if you are, and this was some very bad measurements, if you did better measurements, you could probably do it better. Um, but the gravity depends on where you are on the Earth. So this is probably not the easiest way to measure it, but just to say that you could do this. Yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'll share that. Uh, it's a good question. Well seen. Um, the reason why I shifted the optimization, optimization algorithm, oh sorry, I specified that, is because the default in Optim does not allow me to use bounds. So since I want to compare with and without boundaries, I had to pick one where that is allowed. And then the BFGS algorithm is a good choice. But that's the, that, that, that is the reason. Well spotted. Um, so if you don't, if, if I run, just to illustrate it, if I run uh, this here without specifying the method, but I specify a lower bound, If the bounds can only be used with this particular method. So if you didn't care about bounds, you could just leave the small. Yes. But uh, in order for me to compare, I wanted to use the same optimizer. Because I don't know if you know, will an optimizer al always find the optimum? <laughs> no. It will find a local optimum or somewhere, somewhere close to that, but not necessarily a global optimum. So therefore, I wanted to kind of, in this case, everything converges nicely, um, fairly globally, I think, even. So now there's one more thing left, and that is never present something to me without giving some measure of uncertainty. <laughs> so in order to do this down here, the variance of estimates can be approximated by the second order derivatives of the log likelihood. What you can do, now I should go up and rerun the code as it was. <coughs> There's a library called numderiv, which will help you do this. First, calculate the estimate of sigma hat, which is just the optimization value essentially in this case, divided by n minus 1. And then I solve, take the inverse Hessian, that's just a numerical approximation of my objective function around the estimated parameters, 2 times sigma hat on that. That would give me the covariance matrix, and if I just want the standard deviations of the parameters, I can take the square root of the elements in the diagonal, like this. So what does this say? It means that the estimate of the position has very low variance. Effectively 10 to the minus second. So centimeter accuracy, that is the optimal value. Whereas this velocity here, you can pick any value, it doesn't matter. Also, oh, for the var initial variance, is the second parameter, you can pick pretty much any value. You have the estimate is 10 to the minus third, and you have a standard deviation of that that is 10 to the third. This is before doing the reverse transformation. This is in the log transformed space. So I can calculate the confidence interval from this. First in the transform space, and then in the original space. So the estimated height has a confidence interval, 
but the variance you can pick the confidence interval includes anything from zero to infinity. Not exactly infinity, but something close enough to make it huge. As in the exponential of two times ten to the third. That's a huge number. So what if I did it for the second model where I did not do the log transform? I got those estimates there. I will estimate sigma hat. I will estimate the variance in the same way. It's two times sigma hat square times the inverse Hessian that I estimate. Get some uh, standard deviations of the thetas and get some confidence intervals. The confidence interval for the height, initial position, are almost the same as before. I won't throw them, show them. But for the velocity, as for the variance, it's much more narrow. But a variance of minus 147, it's not optimal, right? So you can say you get a more narrow estimate, but you get also some values that are not credible in that interval. Um, so in this case, neither of them are, let me say, perfect as such, because you would want both a narrow interval and uh, something that's positive. The best thing to do in this case would be to not do what I did, I just used, you can say, the standard definition, assuming everything was smooth around the optimal value, but you could use another method um, based on a likelihood ratio, a profile likelihood interval. may not have heard of it, but just say there's a likelihood-based way to make intervals that are not symmetric, which would be appropriate in this case. Then you would get something from zero up to some value. I haven't done it for this particular case. Um, it wouldn't be too difficult to do, but it's outside the scope of this course. I know I used a little bit extra time. I promise I will not use as much time after a break. Um, but let's take a break now until 10 minutes past. And then I promise to be quick.